Good morning, everybody. This is uh, the last study time with Steve for this year, and we did not plan it to be the day after the election, but it happened to be, and so all the more better so that you guys can hear kind of our thoughts on what happened last night. Uh, Co-hosting with me today is is Mike Razuk. He is a, an executive wealth manager here at the firm. Um, so, Mike, why don't you uh, say hi to everyone? Hello, hello. Happy to be here with you. It seems like uh, when was the last time I did this with you? Almost like last year now. Yeah, it was last. I think it was. Be you did the first one, I think. So it's yeah. been it's been a while. We'll we'll see. Good Maybe to be next back. Year. Yeah, good to be back. So let's see. We've got. Um, we're gonna do slides first. I know you guys are probably have lots of questions about what went on last night and what it might mean going forward. But uh, we're gonna stick to the slides, and then we can go to questions after that. First things first, let's get all of the lawyers happy uh, with the disclaimers out of the way. Uh, one thing I always like to say also is that these opinions that we express today are just the opinions of myself and Mike, not necessarily KWB Wealth. Um, and so uh, just know that going forward, going, going into it. Uh, all right, Mike, these are your slides. So why don't you take us away first? One of the things that's been happening is we, we had the first rate cut from the Fed. You know, they did a half a percent rate cut in the month of September. We actually have another Fed meeting tomorrow. And so we're a little up in the air whether there's going to be a, another rate cut this year or not. But uh, one of the things that, that's been happening is when we look at the data, this is really what the Fed has been focusing on is CPI and is inflation coming down. And so when we, when we look back, you know, we went from almost a 9% rate in, in 2022, you know, now to, to about 2.4 year over year. And one of the things that, that's been really sticky more than anything has been shelter, you know, so there's lots of different components of CPI and uh, really it's, it's been rents, it's been housing prices that have been really, really elevated and sticky. And so the reason why, why I wanted to highlight these items is we're finally starting to see that break. You know, we're, we're seeing the data trend in the direction of uh, prices are coming down, shelters becoming more affordable again. And so we're just not seeing those, those rampant increases that have kept CPI and the inflation numbers sticky. And so what this does is it really helps strengthen the case for the Fed to continue to, to cut rates. And so, you know, we've really seen a, a pretty big decline from those 2022 levels to uh, the, the most recent print today. So uh, I'll let you jump in with some uh, additional thoughts there, Steve. Yeah, the big thing to me is when it comes to CPI, you, especially when you hear, you know, Fed Chairman Powell talk about things, they're always looking at different numbers. It's like, oh, we're looking at the core PCE deflator uh, this time, and we're looking at the, you know, whatever whatever they're looking at, and. What we have been looking at is something along these lines, which is more like what are rents actually doing, not not what oh. is getting calculated into CPI. And the the thing that gets calculated into CPI, which is like a third of CPI, is owner's equivalent rent. And what they actually do to calculate that is they call people up and they say, hey, if you had an extra room in your house, how much would you rent this out for? That's literally how they gather the data to put this into the CPI number versus then, actually just going out and saying, hey, this is what people are renting. actually for. happening, right. <laughs> and, then, and then they go back and they do it six months later. So you got this massive lag time yeah. between numbers and that's, been, that's why it's been so sticky. It's because yeah. you know the numbers have actually come down, but they've got a six month lag time essentially. And so uh, why don't we go to, to the next slide, Steve, because we, we focus specifically on that, that owner equivalent rent. And so, you know, this is, this is showing us kind of the trend that we've seen over the, the last couple of years here. And so, again, you can see that massive spike between the end of 2021 into 2022, and then the numbers have really come back down more to historic averages. And so one thing that, that I'll highlight, you know, with inflation, a lot of people look around and they say, well, costs are still high, you know, it's still really expensive for me to go to the grocery store. It's very expensive for me to, you know, get insurance. And so there's still costs that are elevated from 2019 levels. And just as a reminder, like inflation isn't really prices increasing or decreasing. It's, it's the rate of change. 
And so we're not going to see prices come down very likely. We're just going to see them go up less going forward. And that's that's what's happening with inflation. So we're not really entering a deflationary period. We're just starting to see these costs rise less quickly. And that's what what's kind of happening at this point. So yeah, the, the owner equivalent rent is definitely coming down. This has been the stickiest component of inflation overall. And again, you know, the good news is this is what the Fed has really been focused on when they're when they're coming out and deciding, are we going to cut rates? Are we going to keep them the same? So it, with this starting to ease, it really strengthens the case for uh, an additional rate cut this year and uh, likely into next year as well. Yeah. And speaking on rate cuts, you know, the Fed is actually meeting today and tomorrow. So we'll know tomorrow what they're planning on doing. Um, you know, going into October, uh, they did a, the 50, 50 basis point uh, cut. It was priced in that there would be another 50 basis points at this meeting. Um, I believe that now uh, it's probably going to be 25 basis points. And What's interesting to me is that we just had a a employment number come in that was basically flat. And, you know, you would think, okay, employment is now the focus of the Fed. You know, they have a dual mandate. It's inflation and employment. And if they're not focusing as much on inflation because of these types of things, then they should be focusing on employment. And if employment is flat, it would make more sense to cut rates further. But I think now with the market kind of taking off with the election happening, uh, there's, I don't know, it's kind of competing narratives there uh, with what the Fed might do at this meeting and then the, the meeting in December as well. So this chart that I have coming up, this, um, this was showing uh, the, implied, the implied rate cuts after the 50 basis point cut in October. Um, and so this is a, a little bit of an older chart. I just wanted to, to show it that we were thinking, or the, the market was thinking, that the Fed rate uh, would go from 550 down to 425 with two 50 basis point cuts and then another 25 basis point cut in December. And what would happen or what might happen to other interest rates uh, along with that? So the, like, for instance, 30-year mortgage would go from about 6.7 down to five and a half. Um, and that would be great for, you know, people who are out there looking for homes. What has happened now <laughs> has been pretty interesting. And, and you know, we with Trump winning the election last night, you know, the stock market's doing great. However, yields have spiked. Um, the 10 the year rate is now close to four and a half, um, which is kind of signaling uh, a different rate regime. And part of that, I believe is that with Trump being elected, uh, we're thinking more tariffs. And with more tariffs, probably comes a little bit more inflation. It doesn't mean it will be high inflation, but maybe higher inflation than what the market was pricing. And I also think the market is pricing in a better economy. Uh, you know, that's, that's the big one to me. It's more that, look, things are going well. Uh, corporations are doing well. Uh, less regulation should lead to more growth for the U.S., and so rates are a little bit higher. Um, so this this <laughs> this chart, unfortunately, doesn't reflect what's actually happening. But that doesn't mean that that as the Fed cuts rates more, that you know things won't go back to quote unquote normal. I would say with regards to you know thirty year mortgages and things like that. Yeah, because there's there's two reasons why you could potentially have the the rate spikes that we've seen. You know, you kind of mentioned the first one, Steve, where it's like. Companies are doing well. People are, are selling bonds in their portfolio to buy risk assets. That, that automatically drives up yield. So it could be repositioning for people feeling like, hey, the recession's behind us. We have less risk over there. So let's put more money into stocks. So when people sell bonds, the, the yields go up. You know, they have, to, they have to offer higher yields to attract buyers to, to go back and repurchase bonds. So that could be a possible reason. Or... You know, it, it could be that, you know, things things are starting to slow down a little bit. We're, we're possibly, you know, getting a, a recession indicator here with unemployment and people are, are starting to say, hey, we've we've got to, you know, get the debt in check. 
So you've kind of got like these two conflicting possibilities. I, I personally feel like we're seeing the the former where people are getting excited about markets or feeling like we've got less risk overall. And I don't really feel like this is necessarily a, a debt play, you know, where people are overly worried about the national debt at this point. Yeah. That, More of a, the, yeah. I think yeah. you're right. More of a repositioning. And it makes sense, you know, if if you're gonna if stocks are gonna rally like they do, like they like they are today and yesterday, yeah. it makes sense for for rates to go up. It you know, that's that's what's supposed to happen, <laughs> you know, right. uh, rates, uh, interest rates and and bond prices are supposed to be kind of that counterbalance in your portfolio from stocks going up, bonds go down. And if stocks go down, bonds go up. So hopefully that relationship is returning because that that's kind of what you want in, in a diversified portfolio is things acting differently as different things happen. So uh, the diversification is is hopefully coming back into vogue. My, my big thing here, though, is I still think the Fed is going to have to be cutting rates. Now, the the terminal rate is is kind of what everyone has been talking about. And what that is, I've heard anywhere between four and between two and a half and four of what the Fed is likely going to finish at once they've done their, their rate cutting cycle is over. Um, you know, I, I have no, I have no idea. I don't think the Fed has any idea what that terminal rate is actually going to be. Yeah. You know, I've shown charts before showing what the Fed has said. They're Three going and a to half, do, I think it was, was like their last dot plot or something, but <laughs> who, who knows, but know. Um, you know, you know, let's just say it's around 3%. And so I still think something like this, uh, where you see the 30 year mortgage right around five, five and a half makes a lot of sense in the long, in the longer run. So I think the, uh, the good news is we've been in an inverted yield curve for probably the longest period of time <laughs> that we've yeah. experienced. And so we're starting to just see that normalize again. You know, that's, that's, that's good. That means that the markets do believe that we have economic expansion ahead. And so, you know, it's it's good to see that. Yeah, we want to see borrowing costs come down for companies, for, you know, people who are trying to get houses. All, all those are nice things. But it's also good to, to see the financial markets believe that, you know, the risk of recession is is lessening. Yeah, for sure. All right. This is the last chart I have uh, for today. Uh, the, the bull market hit two years old. We we troughed in October of 2022. And so October 12th of 2024 was the two year anniversary of this bull market. And this chart just shows going back to 1950, all the bull markets that we've had that have gone two years and kind of what, you know, the ultimate uh ending of that bull market was. So on average, we get about five to five and a half years of bull run uh, out of, out of you know, a new bull market. And so far, and I'm guessing this is a little bit higher as of yesterday and today, but not, not very much. The market was kind of flat toward the end of October. Uh, we're up about 60%, 61, 62, you know, with today, maybe we're up about 65% in that time. And on average, we get about 180% out of a bull market in those five years. So, um, and the, you know, the median, so, you know, if you at, lined all those up in order, the, the median is even 107 or 108. So we've still got at least, you know, <laughs> at least double according to this, uh, you know, no, no guarantee that that would happen, but, you know, typically a bull market lasts a lot longer than just two years. Um, the other the other interesting thing, and I think you listened to this one as well, Mike, was there was a company that they looked at the the rolling three year returns of bull of bull markets. And we're talking about um, when you see a double in the market over three years, that's a bubble, which is, you know, uh, if you see a double in three years, it's a bubble. And that would mean you've gone up 100% in three years. So if you go back to 2022, you know, go back to, or I guess October of 2021, and what was happening then and through the, that year, you know, we lost about 20, 25%. So over the last three year period, we're actually just up kind of a normal average percent. So as we move into this new, new third year, 
you know, we'll be interested to see what happens next year, because if we get another kind of raging market, you know, another great year, we could be in that that higher kind of bull territory over three years. But as of right now, it looks very normal the last three year period. So uh, just something to, for everyone to think about, you know, two years in, this is this is very normal. Uh, we're not this is not has not been a crazy stock market, even though we've had two very good years. Um, it's just, it's just very normal. And this is, this is the way bull markets go. Yeah. I think we, we have to remember that usually a big decline is followed by a pretty big gain. And that's what we've kind of seen for 2023, for 2024. And, uh, usually that, that third year returns start to normalize. But, you know, when we, when we have six weeks of positive market returns, which we almost just finished here, usually when you fast forward, 12 months markets are up like 13 percent on average and so there's there's a lot of positive news i would say for the next several months yeah you know we just finished an election markets are rallying markets always do that typically when you have uncertainty clear the air you know regardless of of who wins typically and then we're entering the the best period of time for stocks and so you know the last couple of weeks i would say i've filled it a lot of questions from clients saying hey do we need to reposition do we need to sell you know, there's a lot of rumors that the market's going to, you know, do, do uh, wild things up to the election. And the reality is, you know, November through April tend to be the best months of the year to stay invested. And so we're hopeful that, that the end of the year is going to finish strong like the beginning of the year started. We think that, you know, there's a lot of momentum on, on the side of stocks overall. And so I would say, and you can confirm this, Steve, We've we've been overweight stock allocations with client portfolios. You yeah. know, we've we've been positioned to take advantage of the fact that we feel stocks are going to continue to outperform. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, we've we've definitely been positioned at a higher level uh, on the stock side of things for for quite a while. You know, I would say you know that that's just our overall. It's been our overall tilt, really, since two thousand and you know, 10, 11. I mean, it's been, we've been tilted that way for a long time and it's been the right call. We've had a few hiccups in between, but really, you know, to grow portfolios, it's been the right call to be overweight stocks. Um, and a lot of that had to do with where rates were for a long time. It's like, it just didn't make sense to have to own that much in bonds. You know, now that's shifting back and we'll see, we'll see how things go over next, ne next year. And again, if we get close to that hundred percent, you know that that doubling in three years, you know maybe it's, that's a good time to to say, hey, let's let's pull that back. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that's the end of our slides. I don't think I don't think anybody's going to have any questions about you know anything. But uh, if we, if we do, then uh, we'll open it up right now. So if anybody has questions, you can either raise your hand or just you know uh, unmute yourself and and ask away. Nobody. This there's no way. <laughs> Everything just happened and no nothing. I just maybe we did a great job leading up to the election. And <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask then. I'll I'll ask Mike. Mike, what do you think? Um, you know, we still don't know what's gonna happen in the house as of as of now. But we know that we have a Republican president, we have a Republican Senate. So what, you know, we're, we're kind of 50-50 on what might happen in the, in the House. So what do you, what, what would you say um, as far as going forward? Um, you're looking forward to or worried about or anything like that? I would say... At this point, what I'm looking forward to, I think the thing I'm most excited about is make America healthy again. You know, so I really like that push that we've seen from RFK being on on the ticket with President Trump. Uh, you know, just just because that's something that's always been important to me is just overall health, eating well, things like that. So, you know, I'm I'm excited to see if there's going to be some substantial progress there. Uh, I would say for the the mix here. I mean, we're, we're kind of hoping for a split, you know, like we'd like to see a check and balance, you know, historically the, the stock market has done best when we have either a, a president that's 
Republican and then a Senate or Congress that's, you know, Democrat or vice versa. So we, we like to see the check and balance just because it usually means we're not going to see major policy change. Yeah. So, you know, if there is a Republican sweep, that, that does create additional uncertainty for financial markets just because you open the door to to be able to have some policy change. I I would say, so this is the political science part of me coming out and speaking. So that was that was my undergrad degree. When when I just objectively look at the two parties, I will say the Republicans tend to be more fractured than Democrats. You know, Democrats have always been very good at voting Democratic. You know, they they vote very similarly. And I look back to what happened the first time that President Trump had had won, and there was a, a sweep for the Republicans, but we didn't see any major policy change. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like there's less chance of a major policy change if everything did go Republican than, than if everything went Democrat. Yeah. So just in case it did happen, I don't personally feel like there's a, a lot of risk of something massively changing. Yeah. And again, it just it tends to be because you have some of the, the Republicans who do vote more Democrat. And I, I think that with the narrow margins that we have, you know, there's there's likely not going to be a, a significant change yeah. with policy. Yeah, the so big one to I'm me I'm kind of excited about yeah. that. The big one to me is the TC uh the Tax and Cuts and Jobs Act. You know, all of the the cuts that we got from that. You know, we've been talking about planning around that. And I'm interested to see what gets what gets continued and what doesn't, you know, um under right. under that because there's supposed to be a sunset in 2026 and and now that that changes kind of what might happen with that you know if right. if uh kamala harris would have won it, it's very possible that there would have been some rollbacks in that and and now with this it, it's very possible that it gets ex- you know most of it gets extended and i don't know if all of it does or or if only certain par- portions of it get extended, but that also leads to kind of the deficit, you know, side of things is, you know, the deficit spending. We were thinking going into this, no matter who won deficits were going to go up. It, it just, it does, it didn't matter um, on that right. side of things. Both so, both candidates were, were doing pro growth rhetoric and usually pro growth means that we're going to see continued spending, continued spending usually means some inflation. So yeah, yeah I think, I think regardless of who, took the 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 presidency we would have seen some you know in, increase in in debt yeah so yeah just it'll be interesting to see what actually happens with regards to the the tax cut and jobs act and and what gets extended and what doesn't that's that's the one thing that i have my kind of my ear yeah. ear towards at, at the moment right and the biggest component of, the, of that overall was the change in corporate tax rates you know we went from a 28 percent uh, top corporate tax rate down to 21. So it was a pretty significant cut for businesses in general. And, and you know, that that is something whenever companies have more profit, that typically means higher stock price. Yeah. So and, yeah. And it, I would think I, I would think part of the rally today is because of that is just, you like know, uh, the Harris was talking more about raising that back up, maybe not all the way to 25, I think it was, is, you know, so it just raising it back up. And so now I think there's a little bit of a relief rally saying, hey, we we think, you know, corporate taxes are going to be at least the same, if not lower. And yeah. so that's that's a big relief for, for right. stocks. Yeah. And I think the, the big the big planning concern has mostly been for the high net worth people. Yeah. You know, we had that 13.61 million dollar exemption for estates per spouse that was kind of at risk of sunsetting back down to around 7 million. And so if these policies get extended, you know, likely we're going to keep that uh, exemption amount higher. And so, you know, that, that just is, that's the big thing I feel like was affecting individuals. I mean, especially with, with most of our clients and us being in California, you know, we didn't really see that big of a tax change for income tax purposes. You know, it's like we gave up some of the deductions that we were able to have for lower brackets but in the end, it's like it didn't really provide a lot of change for Californians, I'd say. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, definitely those estate exemption amounts are, are a pretty big concern for higher net worth people. Yeah, definitely. Rachel, you want to unmute and ask your question? 
Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Looking Rachel, at Rachel any... is an advisor here with us. And so she's going to ask a question for us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's interesting that both presidents have, were, or both potentially, you know, the candidates wanted growth. The Fed has wanted to slow growth and try to stop the overheating with increasing interest rates. Mm -hmm. Now it seems like interest rates aren't really going to affect consumer spending. Like regardless of this increase, people are still spending. Yeah. So what lever does the Fed now have to start to slow down growth? Or do they have as much power anymore because of what we're seeing? Right. I don't think the Fed, I think the Fed got way too much credit prior to, you know, for a long time. They got way more credit of, oh, they're do they're working behind the scenes to do these things. That's that's my personal opinion. I just don't think that the the way that they can raise rates or move rates does that much. It does, it did more you know, previously. And I think as time has gone on, it does less and less. Um, you know, the big thing is when you, when you think about what rates are, what rates move when they rate move rates, what do they actually do? You know, for us as consumers, it's, you know, borrowing costs, but really when it comes down to it, it's, it's a lot of it has to do with housing, you know, the, as so go house goes housing. So goes kind of the market. And so when they are moving rates, and most people have refinanced their houses, you know, into rates that are below three, four, three percent. It doesn't really matter that they're pushing up rates. It might matter to corporations. And I think that's what we saw in 2022 is that for corporations, borrowing costs got a lot higher. Um, and, but a lot of the big corporations and what I, you know, wh why I think we've seen such a great bounce back a lot of the big corporations in the meantime were just issuing debt at really low rates so that they, you know, once they once the Fed did raise rates, they wouldn't have to do anything. They've already got the money, you know, kind yeah. of stockpiled. A lot so, of big refinancing of of debt. Yeah. Prior, prior to the increases in 2022. Right. And I'd say the other the other lever. So there's the interest rate side, Rachel, and then there's the money supply. And that's been the big change overall. I would say if we looked at what affected markets most, you know, the, the Fed stopped doing repurchases of, of treasuries. Like lots of times the, the treasury was issuing bonds, the Fed was buying the bonds, and so we were inflating the balance sheet of the Fed. But the Fed stopped purchasing bonds and, and they were actually removing them from their balance sheet. And so that, that affects money supply. And I think that was the more substantial lever overall. And so they could, without raising interest rates, continue to decrease the money supply. And that that does affect the the capability of, you know, people to spend, of companies to spend overall. And I feel like that's been a little bit more substantial yeah. than the the raising of interest rates overall. So they they still have that in their in their pocket. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Any other I questions? Got a, I got a question. Okay. Um, a little different track on things here. I mean, I'm really happy that the campaign ads have now reached their end. <laughs> but one of the ads did, I found a little bit disturbing as it kept being preached to me. And it talked about, you know, how certain people wanted to raise taxes. And then there would be this comment, even on those making less than 200,000 a year. So I guess having been retired now for 13, 14 years, what is middle-class Americans. Mm -hmm. I mean, where I, I know that nobody really defines it very well, but yeah. what does being middle-class mean? I mean, when I hear 200,000, no time in my life have I had an income that reached that level. Right. Yeah. But I kind of consider myself middle income. Right. I, I think, again, I think that's been a big shift because of different geographies. I think middle class in different geographies is different. And so that rhetoric might resonate in California, where more people might be making that type of income or New York. But in, you know, middle America, I don't think that matters. Um, but again, I think it comes back to, again, the rhetoric of, oh, we're not going to raise taxes on anybody above this certain level, whatever that certain level is. And so 
if someone comes out and, and lowers that level, it's, it's a way to attack. I think that's, that's really what it comes down to. I would still say middle-class depending on where, you know, where you live. And that's the hard part where you live is in that 60 to 75,000 range, but you just, you, you know, living in LA is a totally different middle class than living in, you know, Kansas, Kansas city, Missouri. Well, I've seen friends of mine have to move to other States uh, away from not necessarily California, but I've known people who've moved to middle America because sometimes Nebraska is a lot cheaper to live oh, yeah. in wherever they were coming from. Definitely. Definitely. A lot of retirees are moving to Portugal. Yeah, that's true. We've seen, we've seen a lot of that. <laughs> And Portugal is struggling with that now. How many people want to move there? Yeah. <laughs> I think to to bounce off of what Steve was saying, I think I think part of it comes down to the tax rates too, because a lot of times we've seen the the you know the thresholds based off of two hundred thousand or four hundred thousand, and really what what's coming down to it is it's really that jump between the twenty four percent bracket and the thirty two. And that tends to be the, the definition, in my opinion, of where politicians define middle class. So in other words, anybody who's in the 24% bracket and under, so the 22, 12, and 10, that tends to be middle class in, in terms of tax policy. So we see a lot of threshold to kind of phase in when people have 200,000 as a single filer. Let me point that, that out. It's a single filer. And then we'll, we'll see that uh, change overall. So again, that, that threshold for a single filer is the 24% the bracket. So I feel like that's really where they're, they're making that, that definition. So I think, Jerome, the, the thing that kind of concerns us as planners when, whenever we're talking about tax policy, and it's just, this is historic, you know, not, not trying to be political, it's just history, is lots of times you'll see a change that affects, you know, the, the upper class or the higher earners and usually those policies will eventually trickle down. And so that's why we, we typically aren't in favor of, you know, let's just let's institute this policy after a certain t tax threshold. It's just eventually those things tend to have a trickle down effect in terms of, of tax changes. So overall, it's a it's a good question. But I, I believe that the, the thresholds on the tax brackets are really what what drives their definition. Thanks, Mike. That that answers that question. I hadn't seen really thought about the tax brackets, but that's a good point of of separation between things. And it, and if you look at it, it is literally the the middle the middle bracket. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we do have one Q and A question, Mike. Uh, what are your thoughts on global geopolitic the jo global geopolitical environment on the U.S. market? So, in my mind. You know, we've we've been through so much with, you know, I go back to like the start of my career or, you know, I guess when I got to college, you know, we had 9-11, um, you know, we've had, uh, let's see, the glo global financial crisis, um, Greece uh, <laughs> almost taking down the European Union, um, war in Ukraine, uh, you know, the I guess the ongoing cold Cold War between, you know, kind of all the factions now. Bringing geopolitics into investing, in my mind, it just, they don't, they're not, they're two separate things. And the reason being is that when you're investing in corporations, now the input costs and things like that might shift, but corporations are always going to try their hardest to raise their earnings and return those earnings to to shareholders. That is that is the name of the game when it comes to buying public corporations. And no matter what is going on in the world, they are still going to attempt to do that. And so you, you kind of have to separate the two things to say, look, these things are happening and they are always going to happen. There's always a reason to sell, but there's always a reason to buy as well because corporations are really, really good at, at earning. That's just all there is to it. Yeah. I will, I'll add two things that I feel like are very important to the markets today. So the first is 
semiconductors. You know, so if there's the elevated fear that okay, there's going to be a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. I mean, that's that's where really the majority of semiconductors come out at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, so we've seen under the Biden administration legislation to actually try to bring some of that manufacturing back home, and I feel like that that is a good step to kind of reduce geopolitical risk overall. So if we did see something again that is going to affect Taiwan and just you know, the U.S. access to semiconductors, that could cause some kind of strain on the markets. But, you know, Mark Twain would always say, I worried about lots of things, some of which actually happened. <laughs> you know, so again, that, that would be a fear. The second would be oil. I feel like, you know, the energy prices really are the big driver of almost every increase or decrease in prices. You know, that, that tends to be where the journey begins. So if we had you know, a, a bigger conflict between the U.S. and the Middle East, for example, and, you know, they shut off oil supply, well, you could potentially have uh, an increase in oil prices, and that, that tends to be inflationary and would cause the U.S. markets to react. What, what's been interesting about this cycle, though, is we've, we've had that tension. We've had elevated tension between the U.S. and Iran. We've had that with, you know, the, the conflict now between Israel and Lebanon. So the markets, especially on, on the oil side, haven't reacted nearly what, what they did back in, in the 80s. And it's because the U.S. is now the, the biggest supplier of oil overall. So just having some of that energy independence has really helped cushion us from that big geopolitical risk. Yeah. So I think it, it definitely impacts financial markets. And we even said earlier, markets don't like uncertainty. So anytime that you have elevated uncertainty, you have elevated market risk. But, you know, again, I feel like it's more muted today than it has been in the past. And so that's that's a good disconnect. Yeah. And you can even see today oil's down two and a half percent, you know, and because they're thinking that Trump policies will boost up production in the U.S. to stave off something like that. So, you know, so it's one of those where. um yeah, I mean, I think I think you're completely right. There are there are always going to be pushes, you know, pushes, pulls between geopolitical events and what might happen with the economy. But when it comes to, yeah, it just to me, when it comes to corporations, the economy and corporations are two separate things. You know, the the corporations kind of have to go with the flow of the economy, but they are so good. And we are so good at spending, <laughs> you know, the U.S. consumer is so good at spending that unless there's a real shock to 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 our wallets, you know, we're, we're really good at, at at boosting the prices of stocks. So um, so, yeah, I, I think that that's what you have to do is is kind of think of those two things as as separate, but um, separate, but but meaningful. You know, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks everyone for joining in today. Uh Thank look you. forward to a, a strong end to the year. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Bye.